Welcome to Talking Simpsons, where we hate life and ourselves. I'm one of your hosts, Dear Rat Boy Booster, Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons. Who else is here with me today? Hey, it's Henry Gilbert, a.k.a. Slick Willie, always with the smooth talk. And who are our special guests? Matt Crispin here, Chapo Trap House co-host. Oh, and this is Virgil Taxis, best-selling author and Chapo Trap House Ooh, co-host. I'm also <laughs> one of those. I just didn't feel the need to brag. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to our uh, Simpsons celebration of politics. I guess that's what we're calling this. I'm sorry, Dad. I couldn't think of a nice way to say America stinks. So recently, we've been going through all of season one. We're revisiting it right now. But for this week, we're breaking schedule because we have uh, some very important guests coming in. So we asked Matt and Virgil to be on one of our season one episodes. They said, absolutely not. So we decided to uh, we decided to base an episode <laughs> the animation around their... bums me out. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't like it. It feels wrong. So we decided to base an episode around their interest, which is politics. Mm-hmm. And uh, you guys are in town because you've been uh, all over the Democratic primary trail. Just to fully place this in time, we are recording this the Monday before Super Tuesday, March 2nd. So, uh, yeah, that's how we're feeling right now. Yeah, we're all very uh, excited is the word, I guess. Yeah. On some sort of edge, one way or the other. Yeah, mm-hmm. how about that big winner of Super Tuesday, Joe Biden? No, <laughs> no, don't say <laughs> and uh, I'm recording uh, in Vancouver. I'm afraid of being harassed by them, so <laughs> he I had to away. move to another country. Had to be uh, protect himself from the the bards of the new American left. I've heard you guys call uh, Pied Pipers. Actually, I, I like that better. I'm yeah. more of a paladin. <laughs> I am a half orc barbarian. Welcome back to the Bay Area. I guess the first time I've seen you guys in Berkeley. You enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. We just drove around in the Bernie truck. That the that DS, East Bay DSA has, and I got to yell out of the side of the Bernie truck with a bullhorn, and uh, it has meant me think, why have I not been doing that my entire life? Because <laughs> it really is amazing to just be able to yell things at people, and they have to hear it. If And you just like, you see someone on the street, and you're like, I would like them to know what's in my head, and you can make them know, and they can't stop you. I have never seen Matt more in his element <laughs> than sitting passenger side on this this garish uh, van yes. uh, decked out with a, a, a paper, giant paper mache Bernie Sanders mm-hmm. uh, on the top of it, uh, yelling at strangers through yep. a bullhorn. No, it was, it was my full flowering, I feel like. <laughs> I finally carried out my childhood dream of, and I didn't even really realize until now that it was my secret childhood dream to be Alex Jones in Waking Life. (laughs) (laughs) uh, You've been all across the, I guess, sea to shining sea of America. What uh, highs and lows? Like, what's the what's the worst city, best city? Oh, come on! Uh, We love all the cities. Uh, They're all equally good cities. (laughs) They're all cities. Like sometimes you're in Los Angeles, sometimes you're in Derry, New Hampshire. It's basically the same Mm. place. It's all the same stuff, essentially. I guess some people might mad at us for making fun of Iowa, but I'm from Wisconsin. I get to make fun of Iowa, and I can say it confidently that no, 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 thank you. <laughs> That's just there's how a, mid- there's a hierarchy there. Yeah, no, it's uh, just a, just crap. Just a big pile of uh, of corn. Also, he's not being mean. That's just how Midwesterners communicate. It's true. We <laughs> yell at each other. It is the Balkans of America, and we all hate the ones next to us for no reason, even though they're the same people. Have you guys been entertaining yourselves on the road? With Have you been watching any Simpsons? I would assume on a Plex account, uh, not not on Disney Plus. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen. I haven't been able to see any since we've been on the tour. I'm jonesing, actually. I have not either. I think I caught one of the new episodes in a mm, hotel room, mm. but I, I was only like half watching mm. it, so I don't really remember mm. anything Ooh. from it. Let's hope not. Let's hope that doesn't stick to your subconscious. <laughs> it might have, yeah. I also caught the premiere of uh, uh, the, the newest entrant in Fox's animation, Domination, a show whose name I can't even remember, and I'm sure it's canceled by now. Duncanville? Duncanville, yes. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. The, what does that? Duncanville is still going strong three episodes in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. No cancellation notice yet. There was another show that I guess was trying to be the the updated King of the Hill that appears to have been canceled immediately also. Oh, actually, that blessed the Hearts, I think Bless it just got arts. renewed for uh, a second season. Baffling. All of these, all of these decisions are baffling uh, to me because it's I, part of it's part of the King of the Hill extended universe because they asked Mike Judge for permission to use Megalomart. Huh. So Megalomart exists in Bless the Hearts. So well, it's that like doesn't in necess- the King of the Hill extended universe. That doesn't necessarily mean it exists in the King of the Hill continuity <laughs> uh, as well. I'm okay. I'm just shocked that that was picked up again because. 
I mean, bless the hearts, mania did not sweep America. <laughs> I think we sh- by now we should know that uh, as, at this point, essentially all content is monetizable in some way. Mm-hmm. You know, like they make some weird uh, toy out of lead in Indonesia for the <laughs> characters that is incredibly popular in, you know, like... Uh, Burma or something? Who knows? Well, so the real secret of all those shows and why they probably all will at least get two seasons is that after Disney bought all the 21st century stuff, Fox TV still exists and they bought an animation studio to make original things for them. So all yeah. those shows will just keep getting if, made. The, sh- the shows, is, if the if the studio owns the show, it's always going to get at least another season. Oh, so it's like... It doesn't even matter what they're producing. No. They just have a contract. Mm. They just have a contract to buy any animation. Yeah. Like they could produce Wacky Deli, and it's yeah. like totally <laughs> like that's that's great. Here's your millions of dollars. Yeah, let's like, let's let's see Food Fight brought to the small screen. <laughs> okay, that's uh, why the amazing show The Critic got canceled because Sony was making it for Fox. Is that right, Henry? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. That uh, Sony was making it for Fox, but Fox then started making King of the Hill instead. And they're like, well, we own King of the Hill, and we don't own this thing. So, and they didn't like the then president of Fox didn't like it either. So, well, they, if, yeah. if you caught our interview with Mike Reese, uh, he is still bitter about the way the critic <laughs> ended. And I, I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, it was originally on ABC, yeah, uh, yes. for the first season, and it was. I believe this is what Reese said. It was canceled by just a bitter executive at ABC who who did not find the show amusing in the slightest, mm-hmm. uh, and otherwise, you know, just in terms of its ratings like it was like good enough to persist uh and that one you know network exec killed the show yep yeah yeah it's the uh i mean i can understand why mike reese quit hollywood or well oh yeah, it, yeah. as much as he did i mean who wouldn't take a one day a week job on the simpsons for probably a million dollars oh right? sure <laughs> yeah if i had to guess <laughs> um, shows up and writes one vowel but yes that's the state of television today with uh with all the <laughs> simpsons counterparts basically fox tv is trying to find a replacement for the simpsons when eventually they cancel it because they don't own it anymore mm-hmm. and uh the Duncanville is and uh, bless the hearts are one of the many trying out for it. There's like there will be three more coming very soon. And so. Meanwhile, they sold off American Dad to TBS. Yeah, yes. yeah interesting. Uh, yes, they're still they're making them there still. I think <laughs> the TBS. It's, they're they're now on like the twelfth season or something of American Dad. Oh, like fourteenth, something like that. Yeah, they're way up there. Yeah, I gotta it started say, in two thousand five. I think it's kind of an underrated show. It is. No, it's no, way it's better good. than Family Guy. Way better. I it's mean, like it's this. Not even it's close. like the only good Seth MacFarlane yes. show that still exists. You know, well, because he's just a voice actor on it. And right. Other yeah. people write it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they got really weird in a way that was interesting and not yeah. just like wacky the way that. Yes, Family exactly. Guy was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're almost at three hundred episodes. Their newest renewal gets them to three hundred. Oh, good for them. Yeah. Good for them. That's a good thing. Also, I did not know this until a couple weeks ago. I when I was watching Revenge of the Nerds three. Mm-hmm. I did not realize this that uh Bulger is the voice of Snot. Yes. And yes. that's not as is plainly it's not as plainly modeled after Booger. He's a young Booger. He's mm-hmm. a young Booger. <laughs> and I didn't know that. There's there was a joke on one episode where they said, like, hey, remember that thing from Revenge of the Nerds? And I think Snot said, I've never seen it. <laughs> classic. Oh. Classic. Despite Bullfrog. being the biggest pervo, he's the only non sex offender nerd in that group. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> he's a sweetheart. He also uh won the burping contest. But in a, anyway, let's go back in time, why don't we, to to the politics of the nineties. Oh, and, what a uh, quaint and wonderful era that we can all imagine. Look back on fondly. That was when The Simpsons uh, was doing the politics. And uh, I mean, did the show's old uh, classic era episodes, did that inform your politics as as lads, Chapo guys? Ooh. I mean, there's no way it couldn't have. Yeah. The, the things that pop up, I mean, I don't want to step on anything we're probably going to talk about. But just to say, you know, moments that have stuck and have formed my, you know, informed my thinking. Uh, Kang and Kodos, uh, throw your vote away. Mm-hmm. Don't vote me. Don't blame me. I voted for Kodos. Very powerful. <laughs> of course, Three Eyed Fish with Burns run for mayor. Very cynical. Uh, I think that just because uh, yeah, the the main thing I got from The Simpsons probably was that cynicism that was the yeah. default Gen X posture towards politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a valuable prophylactic 
uh, towards you know media and and a received wisdom, but of course something that must be transcended eventually. Well, for me, it was it, it is the cynicism, and I wouldn't call it Gen X cynicism because again, you know, most of the creators of the show were boomers themselves, so they kind of grew out of the National Lampoon right. uh, type, like seventies Mad Magazine type, uh, uh, yeah. the, the comedy boom of that era where comedy became mainstream comedy became more vulgar and darker, and it was a show that was cynical in a way that you did not see on literally any other program on television and you know in terms of simple explanations for the world cynicism is the best heuristic you could cling to yes it's it's just merely insufficient is the issue and mm. uh and the thing is is that in the 90 simpsons they did exactly what they needed to do because it was the end of history politics was basically a spectator sport uh, a revolving door between two relatively similar stuffed shirts pursuing basically identical macro political theories our your job was basically to crack wise on the margins of it right and the show seemed to acknowledge then in the 90s what everyone now knows or at least should know uh which is that yes at the end of history politics is just sort of meaningless spectacle yeah (laughs) well and uh what did you guys think of the classic simpsons era like looking back on it now like especially i don't know it's takes on like clinton or bush or rush limbaugh I got to say, one thing I really appreciate, and I think we can thank John Schwartzwelder for this, is how legitimately mean they were to Bill Clinton. (laughs) <laughs> uh, they were very mean to him. Meaner, way meaner than they were to George H. W. Bush. Uh, which, fine. <laughs> I mean, he he had it coming and more. I mean, I don't care why uh, Schwarzwalder. What like weird, you know, like mustache wax tariff related reason that he hated. <laughs> <so quickly. laughs> uh, I just appreciate that he was willing to just be like, yeah, this guy's a disgusting uh, creep. Has sex with actual pigs. Yeah, as he would say. Yeah. No fooling pigs. No fooling <laughs> pigs. And you know, it was, and I, I guess that you can chalk that up to Schwarzwalder. It was very much so a both side show Mm. it wasn't a specifically liberal program and it's like that distinction is it's it's easier to perceive now in the when it's all in the rear view mirror Mm -hmm. as i got older i came to recognize the place a lot of the writers were coming from like not just generationally but also like there are a bunch of dudes who mainly graduated from harvard which Mm -hmm. is uh you guys on a chop of classic uh you you had your who's the history's greatest monster from harvard Mm-hmm. Uh, off. Yes. <laughs> uh, what? I, so, what do you think of like Harvard and the Harvard Lampoon, like so informing the uh, the show in the in the early classic days? I mean, well, for one, it wasn't just Harvard people. Mm-hmm. There was a diversity of backgrounds. Like Schwarzwelder himself, I don't believe he went to Harvard. He was some no. kind of weird right wing hippie, basically. Like he would have been basically Alex Jones if he'd lived like twenty years later. And uh, Matt Groening, of course, was a more of a, a, a left liberal hippie yeah. from uh, uh, Evergreen College. Mm-hmm. From what I understand about some of the, the behind the scenes production aspects of the show, you know, there was often real tension there between, say, someone like Groening, who would have been like very like anti Gulf War, you know, to the uh, far to the left of Bill Clinton kind of guy, and uh, the more you know Harvard uh, educated liberal milieu guys. You, like when I look back at this, like David Merck. I think is underrated in the political insight in the show, at least for his two years of seasons five and six, because like he was so into he was a, a real Mason's conspiracy theory guy. And like, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That, his, his big push was the Stonecutters episode like that. Oh, that was well, all bravo him, to yeah. him. Yes, that is an excellent episode. And it does tell you more than you maybe think you learned mm. about how things work. And overall, mm. you know, the show seemed far more interested in the writer's particular esoteric interests than it was in in uh, a specific political standpoint. Yeah, like John Schwartzwelder cared more about depicting 30s hobos <laughs> on the show than he did about getting his thing about NAFTA in there. Well, and also I, uh, I think it defined all our politics with this wonderful clip as well. Looks like those clowns in Congress did it again. What a bunch of clowns. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, a while ago... There was a Twitter, one of those viral things that requests you to quote tweet it, you know, and they Mm -hmm. were saying, uh, give your, uh, you know, give your job in a, in a Simpson screenshot, I think it was. Mm. Mm. And me and Will instantly, simultaneously, (laughs) simultaneously posted that. Uh, I posted Krusty 
uh, at the 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 Krusty Live show, reading the cue cards, saying, <laughs> "Talk, to the, talk to the audience." Oh, that's always hell. <laughs> I mean, I think something that makes me like old Simpsons is why I would like returning to the classic politics episodes, like in this one, is. Uh, recently they've not had very good politics jokes on Woo! the show. Uh, yeah, I will, I will say that uh, we haven't gotten these episodes yet, but they were uh, intentionally hands-off with George W. Bush during his entire uh, oh, two yeah. terms. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was really upset about that because Al Jean was on the record saying, like, we were hands-off with him. We didn't know if he was popular, if he was unpopular. But now I think the sh those episodes have aged better because they didn't go in for the easy jokes. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, yeah. Well, topicality, especially with politics is really a smart move for any kind of longevity. The one thing I remember from that era, the only political thing, and I was still like watching the show through the Bush era, like more half-heartedly, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, was I think this was at the end of a, a Treehouse of Horror where the, the planet's basically destroyed. It's Kang and Kodos talking about it like it's the Iraq War. Yes. And saying like, you know, oh, oh, you that. said we would be greeted as liberators. And Ooh. I remember right Wingers yeah. got really Ooh. mad about that. It was also very bad. <laughs> it's also like a very ADR joke that felt like it was written after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, now we have the, uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen it, the uh, the West Side Story parody. We oh, have, like, the video uh, that was one of the worst <laughs> things I have ever seen. No, I didn't see it. Oh, boy. Oh, wait, with the squad? The squad. Oh, the squad, yeah, I yeah. did see it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it rocked. Give me, give me 90s detached uh, cynicism, please, over that any day of the week. I think I disliked most about it was that it just kind of washed, it treated the squad as all one singular person and all basically just Nancy Pelosi jokes they would have done just coming out of her, all four of them, which was, I felt like they just couldn't even understand what, say, AOC or Omar even stand for. They're just like, no, they'd, they'd say, tell him jokes about Putin. Like, is that really what they would do? Is that the joke? The, the joke for uh, all of these things, the joke for every major political comedy program that's on television uh, is to point out the ways that Trump is some way grotesque personally. And that is what all of those awful little sketches <laughs> they've done with Trump are about in like very explicit terms. And that is, I mean, it's just drawing room manners horseshit. I mean, mm. it really is just, it just shows an absolute paucity of insight uh, just laziness. Just it's like the because the thing about Trump is he's such an absurd figure that there's so many things you can make fun of. But that's the challenge. <laughs> that's the issue is that because there are so many things, you have to pick your spot. Mm -hmm. You have to find something that actually is you know resonant beyond just a surface observation. And what a lot of these comedy vehicles have done and all the times the Simpsons have tried to talk about Trump specifically is that they've just clown card on every wacky goofy thing about him or grotesque thing to just like make as the joke, which just renders it into honestly a bunch of Hollywood elites just having a fainting fit over somebody who doesn't, who doesn't feel like they should be there, mm -hmm. which I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know why they, th what they think they're doing with this stuff. I sure as hell don't think, I hope they don't think they're doing comedy. Yeah. If they think that they're ch helping, they're not. Mm. Every one of these people think they're helping, and all they're doing is framing it in exactly the way that helps the right wing. Yeah, and also just on a, a level of comedy aesthetics, it's because Trump is such an absurd figure, it's it's fruitless to try to heighten that and yeah. be like, I'm going to lampoon him by making him even more grotesque. Yes. Because you're not going to beat him. Putting a hat on a hat. Uh, like the actual like the actual clever way to parody Trump would be to uh, uh, show him, reveal him to be this genius this astute genius like that remember that uh the, the phil, snl sketch the phil Hartman Hartman Reagan where he's directing sketch. around contra yeah the, very good he's like calculating uh currency differences in his head and talking in like uh arabic on the phone it's very funny <laughs> well the fascinating things about those new sketches they've done is that the simpsons characters aren't in them and i think like if you're going to make that what if let's say trump hung out with mo or flanders or something like <laughs> oh, get a no, character no in no 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 <laughs> if you're gonna do it don't I do it see some dynamics see that's that. just just like i mean i have come around especially with trump specifically as a figure he shouldn't be in your work mm -hmm. like he, the guy himself i am fully convinced that any decent, I'm, I'm, we're all, I'm sure, dreading uh, the the flood of art that's going to come out of the Trump administration uh, about his Trump administration. The, uh, 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 give, all the game, movies, Game Change Four, Electric mm. Boogaloo, whatever the hell, <laughs> all this other stuff, all the movies, 
And I will tell you right now, any one of them that has Trump as a character portrayed on screen by an actor will suck. Will be bad. Yeah. I mean, just objectively be bad. Mm. The only decent piece of any kind, if anybody's trying to do it, I'll give you a free piece of advice right now. Nope. Do not have Trump appear on screen other than on screen as himself. Mm -hmm. That it, you can't heighten, you can't do it. It's absurd to try to, and then you're just drawing attention to your labored attempt. At like, oh, what is this guy going to try to do with Trump? What are these mm. people going to try to do with Trump to make him funnier than he is? And I'm sorry you can't do it. He was on, he was at a speech the other day, and he's talking about Mike Bloomberg, and he got down. He, yeah. he like got on his knees. He did, he did dwarf. He did dwarf in front of a freaking it. group of people. The president did dwarf. He did dwarf. What are you going to do? What are you going to do that's better than the president of the United States being dwarf? I think if you uh, depict Trump on screen, you should do it in the way Todd Solons might do it and just have him like in one scene depicted by an eight year old boy, uh, another yes. scene he's played by an elderly uh, Asian woman. Yep. Uh, <laughs> just like a bright orange refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. With like a face draw on it. <laughs> and you never explain why. Yeah. No, I like that idea. Mm. But yeah, attempts to, to do a, like any kind of realistic depiction of him falter before the enormity of the absurdity. Mm -hmm. And that's why, hands off. Like, like, uh, what if that becomes like a, a an exercise in acting schools mm. for the next fifty <laughs> years? Is to play Trump like that becomes <laughs> the new King Lear? I mean, who do you think Adam McKay is going to cast in his eventual oh. film about Ooh. it? Like his twenty twenty eight. I'm hoping film. I can talk him out of that. And mm. honestly, I feel like no, he's, he's going to do what I say: eight year old boy, elderly Asian woman, refrigerator. <laughs> We've all decided to forget about the Funny or Die movie that was essentially oh the, god, the uh, dot with Johnny Depp. It yep. was the real life version of all the Springfielders leaving the town meeting and laughing at the comet. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that came out right before the election. Yeah. Right before, yeah. Oh, boy. They, they thought it was quite funny. Still though. available on Netflix. Have not watched that one. <laughs> probably not going to. I actually don't know what that is. I'm sorry. This is probably a tangent. We could talk about it later. <laughs> uh, I don't know who directed it. Some hack. It was a movie like based on the art of the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a feature length film. Starring Johnny Depp in a terrible like wig as Trump in insanity. Okay, well we we have to we have to do a movie episode on that. <laughs> Maybe we should. Yeah, actually. yeah. I do want to. I do want to hear that. You guys have to. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you guys. What, don't you hate pants? But uh, if you could do that, that would be actually cool. that's a, yeah. Put that in the notes <laughs> yeah, episode. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making. I, a note. I'm going to require a large degree of whippets though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least. Uh, uh, I have to. I have to, It's I'm gonna. It's gonna be a race between the drugs and the movie to see which will kill as many brain cells. Watch this to immediately go into a K-hole. Yeah. <laughs> The Simpsons will be right back. With Nod and Mayor Quimby, our town would really stink. We wouldn't have a tire yard or a mid-sized roller rink. We wouldn't have our gallows or a shiny Bigfoot trap. It's not the mayor's fault that the stadium collapsed. Quimby, if you were running for mayor, he'd vote for you. Paid for by the Mayor Quimby for Mayor Mayoral Committee. Mayor Quimby supports revolving door prisons. Mayor Quimby even released Sideshow Bob, a man twice convicted of attempted murder. Can you trust a man like Mayor Quimby? Vote Sideshow Bob for mayor. Woo, what a fun episode this week we have with Matt and Virgil. We were so excited to have them back on for their fourth time, and if you're not a Chapo Trap House listener, I think you'll enjoy it. Meanwhile, this podcast is Patreon supported by listeners like you. Me and Bob are able to do this full time and have on our cool folks like Matt and Virgil because we do this full time as our real ass jobs. Thanks to the subscribers at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. If you go there, you can sign up for $5 a month. Hear next week's episode right now, a week ahead of time and ad free. The same goes for our sister podcast, What a Cartoon, where we give the talking Simpsons treatment to a different animated series each week. From choices as diverse as Cowboy Bebop to Street Sharks. Not to mention so many exclusive podcasts that you will only hear if you're a $5 and up subscriber. Full Talking Simpsons style breakdowns of The Critic, every episode of it. Futurama, the first 23 episodes we've already covered. King of the Hill, the first season, and another one coming your way very soon. All of that for your $5 and up Patreon support. So please check it out at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons.
And if you'd really like to take the Matlock Expressway of podcasts, then you should sign up for the $10 level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. You get all that $5 stuff I talked about and access to our $10 premium content, specifically our monthly What a Cartoon Movie podcast, where me and Bob talk about a different animated film for over four hours in some cases. Our upcoming one is SpongeBob SquarePants the movie. We just did The Great Mouse Detective. Previous ones have been Toy Story, Nightmare Before Christmas, Iron Giant, The Animatrix, Batman, Mask of the Phantasm, Kiki's Delivery Service, Akira, Beavis and Butthead to America, and so many more. And you can only hear those in full over 50 hours of exclusive podcasts if you're at the $10 level at patreon.com slash talking Simpson. So please sign up today. Well, why why don't we uh, go back in time now ah. to uh, to September of 1990 for the Simpsons' first explicitly political episode to go back through some of the the best hits of the Simpsons? And so, uh, I'm of course, talking about two cars in every garage and three eyes on every fish. When we recorded the podcast about it, I would bet we pro- it was uh, mid 2015. So if we even talked about Trump in relation to the story of a rich man buying his way into politics, we probably had a lot of those comet style laughs at the true impossibility of, of that. Well, yeah. the thing is, though, is that the comparison of Burns's campaign in that episode is not Trump; it's no, Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg. Oh, yeah. now because Trump yes. didn't buy the presidency. He didn't buy the presidency. He, bet, yep. he, he made probably money made money off it. Yeah. No, he yeah. did because he was charging the RNC. You know, like rent and stuff. No, he made money running for president. He didn't spend a dime. I mean, he definitely made money winning it. Yeah, it's all mm. earned. It was all earned media because he was famous. Yep. Yeah. Bloomberg is not famous in, in the sense that, you know, he was. He's a politician, but he also has $50 billion to spend. And he is just saying, what do you need? And a lot of people are saying, uh, a new car. And he, he's just giving it to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as well, Bloomberg is at exactly as grotesque as Mr. Burns yes, portrayed as in the show. comically evil and ridiculous and extravagantly like cruel and awful. He genuinely wears his immorality on his face. Yes. And you look at him and you listen to him and you're like, any normal person is creeped out. He's got mm. a fucking beak. I mean, I don't <laughs> think enough people talk about the You mean Burns he, or Bloomberg? Bloomberg. <laughs> well, Burns does yes, kind of have a beak. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at Bloomberg's face, he does not have lips as they are criminally understood. I'm sorry, but that is that is like a bony, hard protuberance that looks more like a beak than any human mouth. Yeah, well, we didn't have Bloomberg then, but uh, when we first recorded this episode, but I think like it. I mean, when they did this in 1990, it was already a long tradition of rich guys run for political office because they don't want to pay fines right. and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, Cl- Clint Eastwood becoming mayor of Carmel, California, oh, because. Yeah. He was tired of the ADA demanding that he put a wheelchair ramp in his hotel. I don't know what he thought the mayor was going to be able to do about that. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I have to break in. We, we do have some breaking news. Oh, no. Chris oh. Matthews, veteran anchor and host of MSNBC's Hardball, resigned from his <gasps> position after criticism over embarrassing on-air moments. No Whoa. way. Whoa. Okay. That all right. Like all right. Podcast knee. is canceled. No. We've got to go. Yeah. We've got to go right. to a memorial. That sounds, like, record on this. that sounds like a knee the size of... Uh, the Statue of Liberty is just bending. Holy Damn. mackerel. Damn, you, you guys killed him. He's yeah, we killed him. R.I.P. <laughs> Bye-bye, honey. Oh, Go home. <laughs> Go home, Chrissy. A loser. Oh, can we adopt him? Can we take uh, him home? You can... I mean, I don't know what he's got. Mm. I saw him in person in, uh, in New Hampshire, and he looks like a cadaver. Uh, well, I, I'm sure he'll have a lot of fun in Central Park now. In, in, uh, yeah, but just going to wait for the lynch mob to show up. <laughs> Uh, But I guess, uh, I mean, the episode begins with, you know, Burns, the testing of the plant, which it's a funny scene, but it's funnier in a later episode. So they in the the Homer goes to college episode. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, it ends up with like Burns in kind of a a real ish moment for Burns of him just like getting drunk alone and sobbing at the that tells you what all oligarchs were in like 1990 that they're like well if he had to pay a hundred million dollars he would be broke it's <laughs> like uh but uh, but then homer gives him the idea of running they're trying to shut us down they say we're contaminating the planet well nobody's perfect can't the government just 
get off our backs. You know, I was just telling the wife that if I was governor, I'd do things a lot differently. Don't get off your soapbox, Simpson. Do you realize how much it costs to run for office? More than any honest man can afford. I bet you could afford it, though. Your junk could get me wrong. I mean, you're an honest man. I mean, it just meant that you could afford to run for governor if you felt like it. And of course, I'm just rambling because because you keep staring at me like that. But but it's true. I mean, if you were governor, you could decide what's safe and what isn't. Where are we going, sir? To create a new and better world. If it's on the way, could you drop me off at my house? And they they have to invent a governor for this episode too, like uh, Mary Bailey. Mary that Bailey, was, yeah, <laughs> yes. I feel like she's sort of inspired by Anne Richards. Yeah, Feels like yeah. it. Yeah, mm, yeah, I, I can see that in her design too. I mean, she was the most prominent female governor of that era, mm-hmm. but she's far more reserved. She's more of like a like a New England type. Yeah, she's sort. Of, yeah, she's a. She seems like a Brahmin. Yeah, she feels like <laughs> honestly like a a Bush. Yes, mm-hmm. but she's clearly a Democrat. I mean, she's, or maybe she's like a, a, a Susan Collins Republican or something. I, I feel like if in 1990 you make up a female governor, it's just accepted that she's a Democrat, especially like... I That's co- true, yeah. And that, and that Burns is campaigning against her in all the ways a Republican fights a Democrat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this episode two was written, you know, co- the co-credit is to Schwarzwalder and Simon, so I think hmm. that's where a lot of like the... Uh, dark cynicism of this episode comes from too. I also I think she's called Mary Bailey after, of course, Donnery's character in It's a Wonderful Life. Well, meanwhile, this is like a Citizen Kane parody. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's kind of like Citizen Kane versus It's a Wonderful Life. But this was the yeah. episode. This this had some of the first visual Citizen Kane references, in mm-hmm. it. and it also made uh, Monty Burns' name Charles Montgomery Burns. They grafted the Charles on so they could you know fit some of the references in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. I didn't know that. Like it's he gives. Gives the speech in front of his uh, yes. his poster, and and at the end when he loses, he smashes up the place in a a withered old man style of the awesome smashing of a hotel room at the end of Citizen Kane. Yeah, I think uh, also Mary Bailey. It's funny they forget they have her the entire time, but then in season fourteen when they write a script where they meet a governor, they're like, "Oh wait, Mary Bailey, let's just bring her back." So the the wiki has to contend with that they did a joke about a male governor in in like a 1998 episode. So on the wiki, they're like, "Well, she apparently retired and was replaced by a male governor." And uh, then in two thousand four, just say they good. don't care. <laughs> <laughs> just write it to say they don't care. What was the male governor joke? Uh, Ooh, I is, think it was a good trivia question. This is. I'm trying to rack my brain here. Mm. Do you know what episode it was? Yeah, if you give me the episode. Uh, yeah. God damn it. You're gonna I'm gonna have to wiki this real quick. Yeah. All right. Well well just give us the episode and see if we can figure it out for that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all we need. Okay. Unnamed governor in nineteen ninety eight. Unnamed governor was mentioned in uh, oh, well, you're not going to remember this episode. The Frying Game. Well, this, which one's Frying Game? It is the 2002 episode where Homer is going to be put to death in an uh, electric chair. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Oh, it's the oh, so that was show. later than you said. Oh, yeah, sorry. Late. It said, oh, yeah, it said no, 1998 yeah. no, on the no, webpage. No, no, right. no, no, unacceptable. No, 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 apologies. No, no, no. Apologies. I oh, failed. gee, I wonder if the episode where Homer's on death row, <laughs> we really need to be concerned with the rigor of the throwaway chair. <laughs> jokes in the episode <laughs> like i really do wonder how these kind of those kind of completist people the canon mm-hmm. people Vir- virgil's kind of one of these i don't know <laughs> i don't know how you people contend with just the the absolute the fact that you're at the whim of these people who don't care mm-hmm. about it well, as much right, as right, no do. no there's all the things you can't be a canon person for the simpsons because there's no real canon because everything is subsidiary to the to the jokes yeah so it's why you know the location of moe's seems to change mm-hmm. every other episode I try my best, though, to be the the Virgil of this podcast. You do. When, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the charismatic, uh, yes, you yeah. know, He-Man genius. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, this. Uh, so when Burns starts running, it's also his campaign commercial is really great. Like first when he meets his whole team, who's like his muckraker, his speechwriter, all these like horrible monsters who are out to destroy Mary Bailey. They then have this like great speech. It's still it, the whole scene works so well because they're just like we got to neutralize this three eyed fish right now. And uh, they did this like eighteen months before Ross Perot, but it is like he is a rich guy who buys TV time to talk about his campaign. Oh, that's, and, that's interesting. 
that they kind of anticipated pro. Yeah, like he's sitting in a chair and talking about it. And I, I love uh, in this next clip how he hires the uh, a band to play Charles Darwin to tell him that it's, <laughs> it's fine that there's a three-eyed fish. It may, in fact, be a kind of super fish. I wouldn't mind having a third eye, would you? <laughs> no. You see, friends, if our anti-nuclear naysayers and choose-up siders were to come upon an elephant frolicking in the waters next to our nuclear power plant, they'd probably blame his ridiculous nose on the nuclear boogeyman. The truth is, this fish is a miracle of nature with a taste that can't be beat. Mm -mm. So, to summarize, <laughs> say what you want about me. I can take the slings and arrows, but stop slandering poor defenseless Blinky. Good night, and God bless. Hold me a moron wouldn't cast his boat for the Wow, super fish! I wish the government would get off his back. I mean, that jingle can't be beat. That's a good. That's a good jingle. He's, I like how he's calling out the Bailey Bros who are doing <laughs> harassment of Blinky. <laughs> Uh, I, God, this is an aside, but in the in the in the twilight of the climate era and the need for radically restructuring energy in America, I kind of wish he didn't work at a nuclear power plant because <laughs> I feel like nuclear power is actually really wildly and poorly represented in media generally. And yeah, that, that has yeah. contributed to wrong ideas a lot of people have, frankly, including Bernie. Well, only to the degree that it is, yes, it's superior to carbon-based fuels yeah. because of, there's no emissions. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, there still are environmental issues sure, involved, and it's right. still mm. a pretty corrupt industry they, where, they, where you know, I, if it's privately owned, they can I, cut corners. And nobody knew that back then. And the thing is, when people think about a nuclear plant, they think about a guy like Monty, Montgomery Burns yeah. sneaking the, the spent fuel out to yeah. dump it into the park or something. Mm -hmm. well, well, but that's the other thing. they is, did do that stuff. There is, true. like, actual waste, and we yeah. haven't really Really figured out where to put it. Well, when Harry Reid dies, we can finally open the <laughs> mountain. <laughs> How's that fair to them? Well, it's fine. Someone's got to have the nuclear plant, nuclear thing. Someone's got to have it, and you're ninety percent desert. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, going back to season one, uh, Henry and I forgot that Homer being revealed to work in the power plant is a joke. Yes, yeah, <laughs> like that is one of the earliest jokes on the show. Like this guy this works in the power works plant. Works in a nuclear power plant. What I mean, when they're writing it in 98 or 89, uh, the first season, they're thinking of only nuclear waste in Three Mile Islands and Chernobyl. Yeah, no, the, 80, yeah. the 80s was, yeah, the energy source that was dangerous was nuclear power. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. And that made sense at the time, for sure. And, I mean, also, as Burns running to the right, I think his one mistake, especially with the rise of the Christian right, is to defend himself with evolution. Like, Honestly, that was a bit of a wrong foot. <laughs> Uh, though I, I like that he, I mean, it's all to set him up later to to lose by saying that the fish definitely tastes good. <laughs> but the, uh, I, I mean, I just his whole his whole speech is great and how it immediately gets people to just say like, yeah, they should get off his back. Come yeah. on. No, it's a very good capsule description of how yeah corporate speech is able to rewire people's understanding of the world around them. Almost instantaneously. And uh, as the episode goes on, it also, we, we've been, this is the first uh, produced episode of season two. And me and Bob have been doing season one, and we've been seeing Marge go from a, like a one dimensional character to uh, at least two, at least two dimensions to Marge. But in this episode, like she is the proven to be much smarter than Homer, like more politically minded and engaged. And I think this is like a really good episode for Marge as a character. Yeah, this is a great Marge episode. Uh, you really see that she has her own opinions. Mm -hmm. She has her own political views and that she's willing to uh, defend them even at the host, even at the cost, the horrifying cost of appearing to be a bad host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, the, uh, the episode... Uh, finale comes as Burns is making gains on Bailey. Uh, I I think that one of the only things that like didn't feel as cynical as it would be in real life is when they dig up that like Mary Bailey got felt up by some guy in college, and they're like, ah, not good enough. I was like. They would have they would have used that against her in the nineties. That's they would have attacked a woman with that for sure. But, oh yeah. Uh yeah, they then decide they're gonna do a, you know, dinner table with regular America thing, which is you know, thinking of it now, it just reminds me of like uh, how every campaign still does this now. I think like those that weird shit Ted Cruz did with his family in twenty sixteen, like all the <laughs> Oh yeah, the stuff. fake the fake meal where they sat around talking about the kids school while pretending to eat salad mm -hmm. that was pretty brutal <laughs> but this specific thing of going to a voter the regular person's house and having dinner 
Mark Zuckerberg did that, if anyone remembers. Yeah, yes. right. When he was briefly flirting with running for president uh, in like the yeah. summer of 2017. There were bef- also like weird pictures of him in food trucks serving food. Yeah. He, I remember he went to, he brought a film crew to watch to watch him have dinner with a Trump voting family in Ohio. Hmm. And I don't, I don't know if any of that footage exists. He probably had it all burned. <laughs> when everyone decided they were going to blame Facebook for Trump, which meant his path to the White House was pretty much foreclosed. Honestly, mm. I get why you do that. You know, because you are a rich weirdo. Yeah. Uh, you do not convey human being at all. To anyone. Uh, and so you have to uh, uh, have, you know, photographs and video of you with real normal human beings, just like you, to suggest that, you know, you too can uh, uh, rub elbows with the uh, with the hoi polloi. But does that really sway anyone? Because all I could think is, you know, I don't want to have dinner with, I don't want to hang out with this person. <laughs> just leave me alone. No, I can't imagine sitting there and at your own dinner table and trying to eat well, out of the corner of your eye, you're watching Mike Mark Zuckerberg's face <laughs> try to like approximate a mouth <laughs> and then pretend, I guess, to put food into it yeah. and then chew and go through all of those painful like rictuses of, of, of attempting to look like a human being <laughs> instead of just having his tongue flick out and just suck it off the, <laughs> off the plate. If you're a politician, I don't want to have dinner with you. I don't want to have a beer with you. I have things to do. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Some people really do, and we've seen it more and more recently. People reveal themselves that they do genuinely see the presidency as like their friend. Mm. Like the president is like your national either friend or depending on your specific psychological damage, best friend, parent. Are people just lonely? Is that it? Is it just like a bowling alone thing? Part of it's that. Part of it is just, yeah, I mean, a big part of it, I think, is that because like a lot of these people have professional jobs, they spend a lot of time watching uh, on screens, watching shows, watching the, just watching the internet stream by them, you know, going onto the websites of of their choice, Uh, that, you know, the president, considering how much they uh, are precedent the life of a person who consumes news, that person is more real to you than probably everybody else, but maybe like a handful of people in your life. Like, think about it, you know, like the average person who doesn't have an extended family, doesn't have a lot of a huge social network, you know, an atomized urbanite, say, mm-hmm. or, or a suburban, <laughs> suburbanite like in an edge city. You know, you've got maybe a handful of friends. You've got your immediate family, maybe only one side of that. Who knows? You know, who knows how but bad blood is in there? Who knows who stole whose headphones at Christmas? <laughs> uh, and then maybe some work acquaintances, and that's probably it. I don't know. That seems people. like a decent that's, social life. Yeah, what well, it does to us, you know, in this impoverished era, but... You know, that still means that out of all the people on earth, the president is somebody who you have more, you think about more and have more intimate daily contact with than everyone on earth, but maybe five people. Well, that's your, but but that's because of your consumption. I mean, if you have the correct media consumption, the president doesn't exist. Well, that's correct, but some people don't know how to correctly live, is the problem. (laughs) People have wrong action and wrong thought, and it's our job, really, to correct that. I think it's because Trump supporters don't have podcasts to form healthy parasocial relationships. Yes. Yeah. 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 They need to get on I mean, that. that's honestly, I think that might be the case. You know, it's mm-hmm. like if you've got a good, healthy, weird parasocial co- podcast relationship, <laughs> I think that allows you to take a step back maybe from the president and say, well, okay, what is this job actually about? What, is, what actually matters? Nobody's going to nobody's gonna help me do my taxes. They're the president. Oh, not, and not like you, the listener. No. I love you. Well, we all love, all we all love, love you. Listen. You're all the greatest host love listener (laughs) Um, well which fanfic would you say is worse to like have a meal with this candidate or who what house in hogwarts are they in like which which is a worse fanfic of okay well it's all it's kind of the it's they're sort of mirror images because you've got one which is what if the president was my friend or whatever Mm -hmm. you know in the sense that what if i was personally interacting with them and the other is you know what if the president was my facebook friend somebody that I'm like vaguely familiar with whose pictures I look at and who I can then, you know, see the results of the BuzzFeed quiz they took about which Hogwarts house they're in. Uh, I mean, one is fundamentally an intellectual exercise <laughs> and the other is more of a, uh, a, 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 an emotional response. Uh, I, they're I, all Slytherin, by the way. I, I do want to note this one thing, you know. I fully acknowledge and appreciate the irony that we are doing this episode describing our current political situation to the uh, uh, 1990s era Simpsons when uh, we ourselves have been quite critical
critical of people who see everything through the lens of Aaron Sorkin or mm. Harry Potter or anything like that. But my honest to God response is, well, it's because the Simpsons are good. And yeah, those things you like are bad. Like Harry <laughs> Potter is it's bad and it's for babies. The mm. Simpsons is, is adult and strong. Like if you're a, if you're a baby and you like Harry Potter, I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, if you're like 40 and you're like, well, uh, Elizabeth Warren is a Hufflepuff, yeah. uh, then okay, you have issues. Yeah, yeah. No, the si- the Simpsons is the, or text. That's all you need. Mm-hmm. If, you, that, if you have the Simpsons, you don't need all other pop culture references are obsolete, honestly. And also, I mean, come on, I've I've like listened to people talk about Harry Potter and politics, and it's like it's always boils down to uh, this this guy's the bad wizard, yeah. and this guy's the good wizard. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing really complex or no. layered in it. Yeah, because it's like there aren't that many bad guys, so it's just they're always they always end up just being. The bet, the nose, the no nose guy. I don't see Simpsons fans participating in the same way online, like saying, "Oh, you know, Trump is Homer, uh, Klobuchar is Krabappel." Like <laughs> that's making all true. The same Nobody's ever yeah. done that. That I mean, fucking the ones who did it. What, who was that Republican I, who I, said I, we want Homer Simpson, Todd, not uh, Lisa? Uh, that was uh, Ted Cruz. Ugh, ugh. He said that the Republicans well, are the he's party. The Simpsons he guy. He said that the Democrats are the party of Lisa, and then the, the Republicans are the party of all the other Simpsons. That's right. Wait, even yeah. though we know pretty clearly from the context of this episode that Marge at least is clearly a Democrat. Come yeah. On. I mean, Homer doesn't, he thinks, I'll get to it in a later clip, he, Homer thinks voting is fruity, so he wouldn't vote for anybody. Fruity. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I have one last clip from this one before we move on to another episode, and that is this clip of Lisa and the heavily reser- uh, rehearsed dinner. My family and I um, feel that taxes are too high. Where do you stand on this highly controversial issue? Oh, goodness, uh, I didn't realize this casual dinner was going to turn into a charged political debate. I was only reading what the... Uh, Homer, I agree with you, and if I'm elected governor, I will lower taxes whether those bureaucrats in the state capitol like it or not! Lisa, do you have a question you would like to ask your Uncle Montgomery? Yes, sir. A very inane one. Mr. Burns, your campaign seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so popular? Ooh, a tough question, but a fair (laughs) one. Lisa, there's no single answer. Uh, Some voters respond to my integrity. Others are more impressed with my incorruptibility. Still others buy my determination to lower taxes, and the bureaucrats in the state capitol can put that in their pipes and smoke it. Momentum of a runaway freight train. That is one of my favorite Simpson lines to bring up. It's, I really uh, wanted to hear Mr. Burns open his response to Homer with a, listen, fat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, man. Come That's, on, man. Uh, come on, man. We're going to get a lot of that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, come on, man. Uh, uh, Buy it. Come on. Just give it one run. Take him a hold. Let me be president. Come on, man. <laughs> well, one thing I do appreciate about this episode is, you know, we, we know a lot of the people who wrote the show in this era. You know, they went to Harvard and they mm-hmm. probably, you know, grew up like upper middle class at least or something like that, uh, which leads you to be a, a lib, basically, uh, a loony lib. Loony lib. Uh, but I like that the emphasis on this in this episode is on Burns being bad because he is a plutocrat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, Burns is evil. Like, they, they only present him being governor as a bad thing. Right. It's yeah. not just saying, you know, oh, he's bad because nuclear power is bad. Like, no, no, no. He is a, a corrupt plutocrat. He's a bad dude. Mm-hmm. They make you feel bad. Like, this is the breaking of Lisa. And it makes, like, Marge the hero for showing that Lisa, like, Lisa's giving up something by even uh, giving that speech <laughs> about uh, the runaway freight train. Though I, w- I would say I, d- I have noted that in later years on The Simpsons, Lisa's politics are, they're less what you'd say progressive. They're more, you know, okay, well, she is just like a coastal liberal who would probably does want to cut taxes, too. Yeah, well, that's because that's who writes the show, you know? Well, I if I could chart Lisa's character a bit, at least up to, like, say, season 12, I think, you know, she is, she's more lefty and she even has, oh, man, that speech she has in, when March becomes a cop. Yes. She's well, shouldn't we be educating people instead <laughs> yeah. of jamming them into overcrowded prisons? Yeah, that that's great, but I note that in season 9 and 10, which I do think are still good seasons not as good but good they make lisa more into like this character of a you know po- overly politically correct whiner yeah, like right they, and they just kind of go from there like they give up her more transgressive progressive 
uh, mm-hmm. beliefs mm-hmm. and just make her the the woman who complains. Well, why can't a girl play football? Yeah, it's the PC thing. Well, I mean, and you're describing I, why you're saying that like that progression of that character. Honestly, that's one of the big reasons that you know Al Gore lost uh, West Virginia and Tennessee uh, mm-hmm. in 2000. You know, just like. Pulcher in in the in the end of history, just shifting pol- politics, shifting completely to the cultural realm. Like it, it was just about scoring points on Lisa. They make Lisa into this strong straw man of political correctness, ruining things, and they just make it about that. Like, I mean, there is a real thing if you are uh, a white guy who's been successful in comedy. Uh, and you like a boomer, and you like reach uh, middle age, and and like uh, your your sixties, fifties, and so you just get so hostile to the idea of being criticized, mm-hmm. you know, for your work, and like it happens to a lot of these guys. Well, and they had daughters coming back from college talking like they put words in Lisa's mouth. That, too, and you know, know, for whatever you believed when you were younger, you know, you have a, you have a nice house now. You don't want to <laughs> fucking your taxes raised. You don't want there to be a, a, a methadone clinic down the street. You don't want there to be uh, homeless shelters in your community. Well, you know, I think a lot of uh, it was also monkey see, monkey do with South Park, uh, which was very yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. Good appears, point. where I was like, well, this is this is the commentary we should be making. Like, if you're complaining about something, you're whining, and you're only in it for yourself. Yeah, and that's what used to turn into. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And they they were the South Park became the new cool thing, and maybe they were trying to chase what was making South Park cool at the time. Or uh, I don't know. Well, it's it's funny you mentioned Lisa because yeah, the next politics episode I only have one clip from that, but the the Mister Lisa goes to Washington from season three, uh, yes. where she enters the inane reading digest uh, P- Patriots of Tomorrow contest, which that I love is is the kids are tasked to write like just the most simple patriotic statements they can about like, if you're, if you're going to burn the flag, then burn your pants and TV. My belly is yellow. I am the American non-voter. I love that it's uh, it's written by George Meyer, who a uh, Harvard graduate, but he is also like one of the most uh, cynical lefties on the classic writing staff too. Like uh, I remember an explainer about his character uh, by his brother-in-law John Vitti on a commentary was saying if this episode got one kid to distrust the cops, George Meyer was happy. Hmm. (laughs) Well, this is a great episode because it is a perfect dictionary example of of a comedy concept that is often misunderstood. Irony Mm -hmm. because that ending is just a perfect prolonged note of satire where Lisa gives her speech about the uh, about how crappy Washington is because she saw a uh, comically uh, corrupt deal go down with a congressman, and then everyone hears it and decides that they're going to make America great <laughs> through uh, getting all the criminals out of there. Uh, ending with uh, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush talking about how his bosses are. The American taxpayer, or whatever that was. <laughs> uh, you oh, girl lost her faith in democracy. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. No, in the light of like, you have bosses? That's right. All 160 yes, million of them. That's it. Yeah. No, the, uh, I mean, that ending is, is great because the realistic ending is Lisa learns the realities of Washington and yeah. is a cynic for the rest of her life. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it gives she, uh, actually, why don't we give a listen to Cesspool on the Potomac? The city of Washington was built on a stack swamp some 200 years ago and very little has changed. It stank then and it stinks now. Only today it is the fetid stench of corruption that hangs in the air. And who did I see taking a bribe but the honorable Bob Arnold? Don't worry, Congressman. I'm sure you can buy all the votes you need with your dirty money. And this will be one nation under the dollar with liberty and justice for none. I think that was an ad buster. (laughs) (laughs) Senator, there's a problem at the essay contest. Please, son, I'm very busy. A little girl is losing faith in democracy. Good lord. See, the, all I love about that is because it, it seems to me that it is much more effective and biting to go in that direction mm. with the I, with the ironic happy ending because it just shows how far, it, 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 it illustrates exactly how far from reality that is. Mm. It makes you think of all the reasons that would never happen. And it makes you like freshly consider just the, the chasm that exists between 
like the story we tell ourselves about democracy and, and the reality of it. When I was a kid, I think I did like as a 10 year old, I think I just read it the way Lisa outright states it of like, oh, the system works. Like, <laughs> face value too, until like the DVDs came out. I was like, oh, right. This is full of shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the way you may imagine you'd want it to be that within two hours of somebody saying this guy is getting bribed, he would be uh, put in jail and finding uh, finding Christ as, as the newspaper had says and that is uh, that's is the ending of one of the urtext of america political culture uh mr smith goes to washington mm. because he he gives the big speech the big filibuster to preserve the boy scouts or some stupid bullshit yeah and i mean can say come here, imagine you know mm-hmm. come on but <laughs> he gives the speech and he ends up you know lo- he ends up running out of time and or running out of energy and you know he he has he collapses but just the power of the words he said make mm. the evil corrupt senator fail to kill himself. He attempts to. I forget that scene. I'm <laughs> yes, he botches, like, Whoa. he botches it. He's like they have, the cops stop him from blowing his brains out, like Casey Affleck in Manchester by the Sea. And then he goes, Ah, oh, he was right. I'm, I'm corrupt. I'm, I'm everything. No. And it's like, yay, we get the Boy Scout camp or whatever. And it is. I mean, that was not played for any kind of irony. That was 100 percent accurate. And just uh, jabberingly uh, insane. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, a good speech changes minds is yes. a, uh, a, a bad thing. Well, I mean, that's and, a bad lesson. But it's also a lesson that I mean, sh- I mean, how how, how are you going to tell people who write for a living, mm-hmm. you know, who who have characters interact dramatically on a screen? How are you going to tell them? Yeah, actually, the content of uh, speeches. Uh, doesn't actually mean anything. I mean, that's their entire lives that you're telling them are essentially meaningless. And in the in the grand sense of actually, you know, moving the wheels of history. Uh, also, though, this episode has um, one of the greats of uh, a parody of one of the greats of political comedy in it. Oh God, yes. <laughs> the deficit rag, oh yeah, the deficit rag. Those budget gaps can be a twelve-digit drag. I'm telling you, that's the deficit. They really made a mess of it. That's the deficit rag. Thank you. Oh, this guy is awful. I know. <laughs> Just sit still. <laughs> the trading gap shuffle. We're in a heap of trouble. <laughs> Who in the trading gap shuffle is there? You already sing this song. No, that was about the budget gap. This is the trading gap. You know, I have to say, Harry Shearer's Le Show isn't much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Shots have been fired. Maybe I want to ask a man in Virgil, uh, Mark Russell, better or worse than Capital Steps? Better. Oh, better just because it's one guy. You know, mm-hmm. one guy, to, there's something kind of heroic almost about <laughs> one old guy in a tuxedo banging away on a piano about, you know, Ken Starr jokes from 25 <laughs> years ago. As opposed to just a bunch of scrubbed, weird, up with people rejects. Mm. I think the Capitol steps. I think they're too arrogant. I think they got too big for their britches. You know, Mark <laughs> Russell keeps it humble, and I appreciate that. He always makes time for his fans. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Russell heads—they're all out there, and he's uh, he's there for all of them. I think the only he's time- a big. He's active on the forums. <laughs> Uh, the the only time I've heard a full Capital Steps performance was when they did their post a nine eleven thing and it was just on NPR and I had it on all the time I, and it was one of those like can we be funny again moments Ugh. type things it was it was a dark time a dark unfortunately time. the Mark Russell uh, Reddit has been quarantined <laughs> <laughs> I I, saw, I just checked I, I I actually heard the Capital Steps once on NPR. It was it was like I think a performance during Wait Wait Don't Call Me or something, mm. and I was and I didn't know what it was going to be. I just turned on the car and it was on, <laughs> and they were singing a song about uh, this was a few years ago. So this was about the Greek uh, 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 credit uh, crisis. Oh jeez, and it was, it was Greece. You know, like mm-hmm. the song. Yeah. Oh, it was about yeah. the country. Oh, oh boy. And I wanted to steer off the road and into a, a, a abutment. I wanted I wanted to end my life. My, I, I think I just started screaming like Harvey Keitel at the end of Bad Lieutenant in the car. It, it is, I mean, the Capital Steps is no joke just like, a, like just huffing gasoline in terms of comedy. I had a similar experience when I heard Harry Shearer's Waterboarding USA. Oh, oh, look it up. Not oh. good. Not good. There's a video. Ah. Mm. That motherfucker is going to look down on the Simpsons. How <laughs> dare he? I can't believe it. I'm not, got, like, you're better than that. Shut the fuck up. I'm now imagining the Capitol steps uh, you know, at rehearsal the morning of 9-11 and just standing around <laughs> a TV and going, guys, we got to do something. Yeah. 
<laughs> what rhymes with Bin Laden? Let's find out all the things. <laughs> the Mark Russell retired in October 2016, and you know, I think just like John Stewart, we need him more now than ever. See what the know? heck? How is he not out there doing Trump? So many things rhyme with Trump. He's he's quite old. I oh, think. Honestly, yeah, but how would the lure? Come on, <laughs> he, he probably thought of 55 Trump rhymes like the in the morning on the bathroom. I think it's like a a Tom Lehrer thing, and you know, he sees Trump get elected and thinks, well, you know, that's it. My job is over now. <laughs> My work is done. I, I also, I really. God, that was political comedy at that point. It really was. It was like, it was terrible po- song parodies about the deficits. <laughs> I, that's what I love too about their choice of, they make it about the most boring thing possible the trading gap and the budget gap. Like, not even like spicy scandals or anything. There weren't any. That's the thing. <laughs> People forget this. There wasn't anything. Like, we, we're, we're, uh, it's like, yeah, climate apocalypse, war everywhere. Oh, oh yeah. By the way, there's a giant global pandemic uh, going to come and yep. get <laughs> literally all of you. Uh, the 90s, it was shit like the fucking trade get gap. At the, remember the goddamn V chip? Uh, yes. That was yeah. maybe what a six month controversy and like long time. running into the 1996 election. Yeah, are we going to put a little guy in your TV? To stop your kids from seeing swears. No, too much uh, sex in movies was one of Bob Dole's core campaigns. Yeah, the the the, uh, the the horrors yeah. of depravity of Hollywood. Yeah, that, the beach was, was a major plot point in the uh, South Park movie. It was a wildly, wildly parched environment. I yeah. mean, there was very little. I mean, you because the because we were at the end of history that there was there weren't these big Titanic issues. It was all just this petty cultural sorting because this is the year, the decade, really the nineties were the decade when that cultural sorting was really accelerated. And, you know, uh, Futurama, which was a show that was famously about five years behind everything else, uh, ironically enough, since it's a show about the future, did an episode about the V-chip when they came back from cancellation in, like, 2008. Also, uh, the Susan Boyle Boyle that was also from the return. Yeah, and when the I, Susan like Boyle years thing happened, after that. No, happened. the Susan Boyle thing. I think the original Susan Boyle thing happened while they were first still on the air, <laughs> and then they just. You know what? We needed that. We needed that time off to really nail the jokes <laughs> about Susan Boyle. I think uh, in the original run, they really covered the end of history uh, stance on the presidential election. Henry and I recently did the episode "Ahead in the Polls," where oh, it was okay. uh, John Jackson versus Jack Johnson, and they were clones of each other. Yep. Yeah. The five cent titanium tax. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, we did see that with just recently with Beto and Pete and the, on the debate stage together. <laughs> that was uncanny. The, fi- I wish the 5% hung percent difference was heterosexuality versus homosexuality. I guess. And it turns out people like gay stuff now, I guess. That's, <laughs> I, wow. I'm a fan of it. I'm yeah. pro it. But <laughs> people, America, America was like, yes, if we're going to have this, let's get a gay version. <laughs> no gay person I know that liked Pete made less than six figures. Like, oh, there was I, not that's one. Shock. <laughs> that's a shock. Uh, but anyway, why don't we move on now to season six and probably I think the show's best politics episode ever Sideshow Bob Roberts. Oh, of course. Which um, to we talk about the writers on it like I think me and Bob have said like five and six probably best seasons because oh, yeah. Dave Merkin is this really like his time as showrunner he made some of the funniest episodes and he just upped to the insanity and the cartoonishness a whole bunch but then you have bill and josh with their like they're so the opposite of of merkin stance like they have so many great jokes about boring things and naming every type mm-hmm. of laundry detergent and <laughs> so here you have like uh, in a political sense i see it as like david merkin's like love of conspiracies meeting bill and josh's love of nixon and watergate and all that stuff in in like one episode and bill as well oh. you know grew up in uh northern virginia he grew up in dc land yeah he's a friend of our shows he's been on both of our shows and yeah. when we did this uh podcast a while ago henry we realized a lot of this was uh, also Dukakis and Bush, the oh, yes. election. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the uh, I mean, Quimby is uh, is quite an ineffectual uh, Dukakis style Democrat here. Not he has none of the energy of a Kennedy in this in this episode. The scene. Uh, speaking of the Dukakis, yeah, the uh, the scene with Barlow, spe- uh, the speech or the the question he asked for Quimby at the debate. That's basically a reference to the infamous Kitty Dukakis question. It, it's a lot of references to the 88 race, though I would argue Quimby is is more a parallel of Clinton because of his mm. personal debauchery. 
He's mm-hmm. a horny goat. Yeah. He's no longer illiterate. You, like, yeah. you know, you, you, you see him, uh, and a joke I never got as a kid, watering the marijuana plants. <laughs> he got away with the marijuana Hot plants. smoking he... spendocrat. Yeah. And that's what's so good about it. He, the, right before that, he goes, tax smoking spendocrat. And there he is, <laughs> watering his pot leaf. Yeah. Well, here, actually, I've got the clip. Let's give it a Yes. Go. Now, I'm not very political. I usually think people who vote are a bit freaky. freaky. But for some reason, this Birch Barlow really speaks to me. Good morning, fellow freedom likers. Birch Barlow, the fourth branch of government, the 51st state. You know, there, 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 there are three things we're never going to get rid of here in Springfield. One, the bats in the public library. <laughs> Two, Mrs. McFeely's compost heap. <laughs> and three... Our six-term mayor, the illiterate, tax-cheating, wife-swapping, pot-smoking, spendocrat, Diamond Joe Quimby. Hey, I am no longer illiterate. Now, why are we doomed to this Quimby quagmire, you ask, oh, reasonable listener? Because this town is under the stranglehold of a few tie-dyed tree-huggers who would rather play hacky sack than lock up the homeless. <laughs> uh, so it's good. Presidential Medal of Freedom winner Birch Barlow. Uh, yeah, I have to say that the way Homer says "fruity" there, one of my all-time Fruities. favorite line readings on the entire show. Uh, this one also has one of my all-time favorite jokes in the show, and it's it's like the one non-political joke in this episode when when Homer's listening to Barlow in the car with Lisa, and he says, "Well, Lisa, uh, when you drive, you get to pick the song," and then it just cuts to Lisa driving and listening to the song "Saint Elmo's Fire." <laughs> That's a perfect Lisa song uh, yeah excellent excellent song choice on that also uh my other another of my favorite jokes of the show is also for this but also the non-political one uh is uh, stay out of riverdale yes oh yeah, yeah. that was that episode too. Well, oh, excellent. stuck up riverdale pucks <laughs> okay i've got <laughs> that a fantastic clip. callback i've got that clip too let's let's give that a li- listen <laughs> uncle mayor was just saying that us kids are the most important natural resource we have more, more important than coal, than coal? uh, a, uh <laughs> yes <laughs> that was a big mistake, Bart. No children have ever meddled with the Republican Party and lived to tell about it. <laughs> uh, stay out of river. <laughs> It's the duh and moose that really yeah, no, gets me. Duh, stay out of Riverdale. <laughs> I, I, I think what we're all missing, though, is that this episode is based on, the title at least, is based on the movie Bob Roberts, which no one ever references or talks about. No. Have you guys seen it? I, I have. It's a great movie. I have not. I'm very surprised at that. You should see it. Oh uh, Yeah, I've always meant to. No, it really, it definitely gets, it, it, it's very impressive. I mean, just looking back on it, he definitely, uh, Roberts definitely gets what's like what will right populism is going to look like in terms mm. of and how it's going to be commodified and stuff. There's a lot of uh, political films that I've just never seen or really had that much interest in seeing, like uh, Citizen Ruth. Citizen uh, Ruth, I haven't seen since I was a kid. I should rewatch that one. I haven't uh, seen that one. The, uh, From that era, yeah. specifically. I mean. Yeah, but uh, no, Bob's, Bob Roberts is highly recommended. Uh, and, and because it came out in you know the early 90s, uh, it's got a lot of... It's amazing when you look back at it because one of the big plot points of the movie is that bob roberts the guy running uh who's this like right-wing folk singer uh Mm. uh, who does like bob dylan songs but about reaction he has an album called the times they are changing back oh that's the gimmick uh and it's very clever i didn't know that was yeah yeah but he's also like a he's also i guess like who's involved with like uh the iran contra affair and all that shit uh and the spending savings and loan crisis and it's and it's all in there because you know the movie was made around the time that all those things were really happening and you know like tuned in lefties like Tim Roberts Robbins are very aware of things like you know the, the Iran Contra pardons and stuff like that. But it's amazing looking back and just thinking, oh yeah, most people who are going to watch this now aren't even going to get any of the, these are references to real scandals. Mm. Like they've been completely buried by just the rush of history. But back to uh, back to Archie. What I love the most about that joke is th- it leaves to your imagination what Homer did in Riverdale to get kicked out. I mean, we, I can figure it out. Uh, you, think he, you think he went ham on those bergs? At that? I, it, it pops his malt shop. Yeah, it pops. Yeah, just <laughs> ate all the bergs. I used to say chocolate shop. That's, yeah. the, that's the name of it. <laughs> because it can be he made like, a pass at Mrs. Weatherby. Oh, God. You know what? Oh. Now, see, we're having fun here, but now I'm just imagining 
saying that because we live in an infinite Simpsons universe, and that means everything that could be on The Simpsons will eventually be on The Simpsons, that at least in a cold open, there's going to be them hanging out in Riverdale. <laughs> and it's probably going to be the sexy Riverdale mm. from the new show that the idiots watch. Oh, do you think they'll make a sexy Simpsons for the CW network? Mm, well, that's more of a warning. I mean, Disney is uh, anti-sex on Disney Plus, though. That's so. true. But and, I mean, they're about to make the new short that's coming with Onward is like a Rugrat short of just like Lisa, uh, Maggie falls in love, mm. and it's like babies go to France. It's uh, it looks weird. <laughs> Wait a minute, Maggie Simpson? Yeah, yeah. Maggie yeah. Simpson. with yeah. the Rugrats. Well, no, I mean it's no. Rugrat style, and it's like oh. a baby's it's adventure. About baby. But it's baby about Mar- Mar- about Maggie Simpson. Yes, yeah. I don't yeah. like that idea at all. Well. P- they want. They hope to get an Oscar for shorts, so they think uh, it's, their, it's their big shot. I, think, yeah. I wish. I wish them luck. I wish. Hey. Them luck. Uh, the other uh, another race that this episode directly references is the 1994 Virginia Senate race because yes. Sideshow Bob is very obviously modeled after uh, Oliver, Oliver North. North yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Who, uh, interestingly, uh, Oliver North, not a felon. No. Pardoned. That's weird. No, not pardon. It was, uh, he won on appeal. It was overturned. Oh, right. Oh, wow. So he could vote for himself. Yes, yeah. yeah. So he was technically not a felon in the way yeah. that Bob is. <laughs> uh, but but I love, yeah, it's it's what's great in their Willie Horton parody that they say he even let out sh- Sideshow Bob. Uh, well, and also our friend Bill Oakley, like, he wrote a piece in the Washington Post about how the attempted murder really like that was the actual stance of the GOP in the that was pretty uh, funny. recent impeachment. And you yeah. know what? It works. So who cares? Yeah. C- congratulations. Well done. <laughs> it will, uh, j- just like in the show, it worked. Folks, like, <laughs> they wanted it more. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Good game. The uh, well, also, I th- when I watched it this morning, the parallels I noticed too were like one that Lisa is totally just the usual fed up. Dem- Democratic voter who, like, she literally says, like, he this time he's the lesser of two evils. <laughs> like, and and in in just the same way, like, Quimby has this losing ass campaign, and Lisa, as part of the youth vote, has to like do all the work for him. Where they're like, Uncle Mayor says we're the most important. Like, it's uh, it's sad. Yeah, anyway. and it's also uh, it's also going to be the model for Democratic politics for the next twenty five years. Mm. From the time that that was filmed, so kudos to them for getting that one right. Yeah, yeah, they called it. They did call it the. Uh, I mean, well, also like these debate questions here in this next clip, uh, pretty much the same, I'd say. Sideshow so, Bob, Councilman Les Wyman says that you're not experienced enough to be mayor. Sir, what do you have to say about that? I'd say that Les Wyman ought to do more thinking and less whining. Ah, master class. There's no counting in less whining. <laughs> Good line, though. Mayor Quimby, you were well known, sir, for your lenient stance on crime. But suppose for a second that your house was ransacked by thugs, your family tied up in the basement with socks in their mouths, you try to open the door, but there's too much blood on the knob. <laughs> what is your uh, question? My question's about the budget, sir. Oh. <laughs> Flames digitally added. Yes. That's a very good Limbaugh. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. an excellent Limbaugh. It's got all the, the rich chocolatey notes. Yeah, like uh, Shearer hits like the way he like smacks his mouth as he or yep. shuffles the paper as he's thinking things. They must have known. Like Shearer must have busted out a Limbaugh impression well before this episode, right? Oh, I'm sure. Like he didn't just like come up with it. Well, yeah, because he still had that sh- the terrible show you're talking about <laughs> back then. So yeah, I'm sure he, show, yeah. he busted that one out. Also, yeah, the less wine in one, like it doesn't matter. It got a good line. It doesn't matter that he doesn't exist. Yeah, no. <laughs> The joke is still solid. Yeah, I. Which is, it seems like he definitely was going to be Quimby anyway, so he didn't need to steal the election. Like Quimby was just like. Well, that see, that's sort of. I, I honestly think of that as. Uh, I guess that's sort of lazy, uh, or not lazy, but just in. I don't know. Well, Sideshow Bob ambiguous. can't stay mayor. That needs to reset. Right. It does feel. End, so, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It just. It kind of feels like a parachute thing. Of like, oh, we have to solve this now. Mm-hmm. Well, and like I, he stole the election that he was going to win anyway. Well, I also like to think it's saying Sideshow Bob is such an inveterate crook that. He he would rig an election. He's already going to win. To one hundred percent of the vote. Yeah, like too. Because he's a maniac. Yeah. He's a maniacal person. He tries to blow up the whole town later. Yeah, he's yeah. a bad guy. He's, he's not good. No, dude. he <laughs> would be like the Voldemort of this. <laughs> well, see, but now he's cute though. I'm sure. I'm sure he's adorable. He's probably like 
Ugh, he's probably got like back with Patty or something. Stop, stop. I, I don't think they've done. They've gone that you're far. You're just yeah. the yeah. theorizing things to get you mad about later. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. You know, bad people do that about our show. Excuse me, but mm. did you see the one where he was the mayor of the town in Italy? Yes. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. tell me that's not possible. Right, Fall out right. of here, please. <laughs> he's got a kid, right? He's got a kid. Yes, yeah. he's got a little mm-hmm. bam- a little bastard Italian child. <laughs> <laughs> At least John Mahoney lived to play his uh, dad. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah, he did it in his lifetime. That was a good one. I rewatched that episode. They, the the worst thing in it is that they. They get David Hyde Pierce for like two lines. Like it's like you bring back Cecil and you're not going to have him talk that much. Yeah, like, that's a shame. Yeah, but that's yeah. like they would have to. They would have to have Cecil talk, and that will remind people of a good episode. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> like you want to. You want to just be the fleeting. Oh right, from the other episode. You don't want people to have a chance to be like, oh right, the one with the jokes that were funny. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> there were some funny jokes in the Italy one. I mean, they still have good gags in these episodes. From time to time, yeah. Like, when you make as many jokes as you do, like, you're going to get something's got to hit. Yeah. 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 Well, another thing about this episode that reminded me of recent politics was that, like, there's all this demand for Quimby to free the political prisoner of Sideshow Bob. And when he gives in to this right wing bullshit and uh, frees him, that becomes his greatest enemy who defeats him in an election. And like that. No, that's very it, appropriate. It feels like giving in to birtherism, for example, like to me. No, yeah, you can't give an inch because they're going to take as much as they can. He thought, uh, I'm sure Quimby thought he was going to be popular by doing the thing all the Birch Barlow cranks were asking him to do. But uh, yeah, also all the old people jokes of the Matlock Expressway. Yeah, Matlock like Expressway, too. very funny. <laughs> They're up there with the old timey car already with Forcey Fields. <laughs> And doing, be- the, doing the awuga horn. Very good. <laughs> and I think this was a syndication cut, but it was uh, Bob also speaking to the old people and mm. saying, not only will I build the Matlock Expressway, but I will also listen to your tedious stories that go nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then there's a solid like 15 seconds of one of the stories, so it made it like a, a ripe syndication cut. Was that Edison reading the alphabet on uh, the radio? They would say... B would usually fall. Yes, yes, yes that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, the uh, it's there's God. It's it's one of the best episodes I ever did. I also uh, we said it when we did the full podcast on it, me and Bob. But it was refreshing that it just took a it, a lot of Simpsons was both sides in it, but this one was like Republicans are evil. Yeah. Like it, they are Dracula is a Republican. Yes, literal blood yeah. Well, so. I mean, you know, the Stampy episode really put it out there. Oh, yeah. you know, they're, they're we're just evil. <laughs> And the Democrats are we can't govern, and those aren't exactly the same thing. And also, Although, we hate life and ourselves. We hate life and ourselves. Mm-hmm. Although I feel like that is see, I think that's a good example of like the way that cynicism has changed over the years. Like that idea that oh, Democrats, bunch of goofballs, they keep fucking up so much. Why are they not better? I think at this point, you know, once history started happening again, people have come around. I think more and more to the idea. Oh, they're not. They're doing that on purpose. Mm. <laughs> this is not just, oh, darn it, just can't get it together, guys. Sorry. it's This is their go- job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is their goal. And I feel like that, I mean, you know, I don't really blame The Simpsons for not having that, you know, on in the tank in like 1994 or whatever. Yeah, you didn't know in 1994. I sure shit didn't know. Uh, but like just... The we hate life in ourselves, though, I think that's very, very, very resonant. I think, I because think that's how could you if that's your job? <laughs> yeah. If that's your job to be that, to be that like stopgap uh, between popular mobilization and political change while literally lying to people about what you're actually doing, I don't know how you couldn't hate yourself mm-hmm. and life. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, there's one more before you guys go uh, that I wanted to touch on, and that was. Citizen Kane. Yes. From season eight. Love it. The um the gutsy move of doing an episode that is out of date eight days after the episode. I aired. respect it. No, that was a strong move. Mm-hmm. And, the also and, gutsy move of killing the sitting president on screen. Yep. That was amazing. <laughs> and you know what? This is a good example. You know, uh, all those comedy rules, you know, they all they're all contingent on uh, what your your ability. You know, that might have been dated, but it was really good. So it's now remembered fondly as one of the best. Yeah, we uh we talked with Oakley about it uh on stage on our, our Halloween live show we did with him in portland yes i heard that one that was good <laughs> oh thanks, oh, thanks. Thank you. yeah and well and he talked about how like that's exactly how it felt then it was america flips a coin like yep. this is just an no th- i cannot think of a, m- of a more i mean like the bush bush gore i mean and it looks back it's very fraught and it what but at the time the people were like what is what is the difference between these guys mm-hmm. what are why are we even here that rage against the machine video that yeah. michael moore directed i mean that just shows you like yeah. this is what it was then that's yeah. how everybody felt but yeah. uh i think like <sighs> 
that that sense was strong. I think partially because they kind of read as the same guy in a lot of ways. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas he, the the Clinton Dole campaign was even more vapid. I mean, like there yes. was it was like violence in movies. Uh, ba- o- Dole promising a 15% tax cut and then just doing a bunch of stunts to get attention, like dropping out of the Senate, saying he's going to campaign like the last 48 straight hour oh, state yeah, days or something that, yeah. until he pitched off the front of a, f- a fucking oh. uh, 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 hay wagon or no, something. It was an election. That's a hilarious photo. It was an election video, about nothing yeah. except image. And I think that was the election that, that reified the Carville view of politics. Yes. Uh, that it's not about substance and it's just about being young and optimistic and smiley. Yeah. It's and the bridge to the 21st century. Bri- that shit. was the slogan, the bridge to the 21st century. Which honestly, century. if you had, if you're making a decision to vacuum, which people basically were at that yeah. point, yeah, nobody and it's between uh, Clinton and Dole, I mean, yeah, you'd vote for Clinton. Why the hell not? Yeah, because Dole was a, like a angry old man. I yeah. mean, he really was. Like that. Like I was oh, saying. Oh, he was a bitter it man. Was a more vapid, it was a more vapid uh, campaign than, than 2000, but the con- the actual contrast between the candidates was greater mm-hmm. because Clinton was this like relatively young, cool guy, and Dole was just this like cartoon initially curmudgeonly old i mean walking ghost literally he could he had a hand with the pen <laughs> fallen off of the stage falling yeah. off the stage and it was just sort of people were like oh this is embarrassing at the time i remember being a kid and really rooting for dole because mm. all of the dole related comedy that i was cont- <laughs> was way better than the clinton stuff <laughs> like uh uh, uh norm mcdonald on SNL as oh, Bob yeah. Dole was hilarious. That's why it was hilarious where the, the day before the, I think the last weekend update before the election, uh, Norm ended at weekend update by saying, Go, don't forget to vote for Bob Dole, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is uh, very impressive. I did uh, enjoy Bob Dole on the real world. That sketch. Very good. Who took Bob Dole's peanut butter? No, all the Bob Dole skits were, were and, excellent. And the, but the, my favorite the Bob Dole comedy uh, of 2000, 1996 was the clutch cargo uh, Conan sketches yeah, with Smigel, and Smigel would play Clinton and Dole, and his Clinton was like a kind of a cartoon hillbilly cowboy, He'd be like yee hawing all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his Dole was just this yeah bitter, angry old man, and I just know that I loved the Dole so much more. I thought it was so much funnier when Dole came on. I was so excited, so I was just I was like, give me this guy. I want this. This is funny. Give me the uh, give me the angry crotch the old dude. In in '96, my politics were really. I was 14, and like other than Simpsons defining my politics, the the content I was watching was like uh, Michael Moore's TV Nation and uh, Politically Incorrect mm. with Bill Maher. Like I I remember I wasn't watching CNN to see the '96 results. I remember when like Bill Maher on the live politically incorrect just announced like oh bills won it this ended two hours earlier than we thought it would uh, i guess uh, we got to keep talking though mm-hmm. uh that's uh, and so this episode also was like a uh it told me who they were and i like that homer thinks he's mumbly joe and doesn't know what's, uh, what's <laughs> mumbly <going> joe <laughs> i saw him on tv the other day <laughs> the president, uh, but yeah, and this one's written by David X. Cohen, who on the on the commentaries that were recording during the W. Bush years, they do mention some regret about the two side. They're the same guy. There's no difference, kind of speech, because they were feeling that. They they were very much in the 2004 thing of like no really the lesser of two evils you got to vote for Kerry uh, kind of situation then so I I wonder how they feel about it now the uh, the episode I mean it would have been bad if Dole had won though yeah. I'm trying to think of how bad it would be because the thing about Dole is you know he was a really vicious guy when he was a Senate Majority Leader like he was the Reagan's point man for he was Reagan's hatchet man against the uh, social welfare states mm. uh, and he was responsible for a lot of welfare cuts in that era and in terms of abortion though i don't think i mean i i i would guess Dole is like very anti-abortion but i don't think he, he was like a hardcore anti-abortion guy i think he was just kind of going uh where the wind was blowing because the actual religious right did not no like he was Dole, not there and guy. they did not trust him either uh but so you want to talk about you know uh social welfare cuts i mean that was the fucking clinton's first term that's the thing that's what he had that's why he got blown out so badly besides optics is he had nothing to run on because clinton had spent the first term triangulating in the direction <laughs> of all the Republican complaints about big government that were left over from the Reagan Bush era. He had nothing to do. So uh, he was, and he was visibly annoyed by it too, which was very funny. Like, he's just like, this guy stole my platform. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> uh, and yeah, his big thing was 15% across the board tax cut. Just mm. a big number, 15%. Come on, I'm giving you money. 
And uh, the the primary is pretty much all sewed up by like February, right? I mean, like I know Forbes and Buchanan gave it a little shot. It was but... a little. It was a few months after because they didn't start as early back then. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, oh no, they, like Dole Dole ran away with it yeah. starting like. Well, didn't didn't I've got to check this and please was... elite if I'm wrong, but I thought Pat Buchanan won the New Hampshire primary in '96. Uh, yes, yes. I, I do believe he did. Yes, that, that sounds correct. Yeah. I, I was just trying to think like at what point in the writing of this do they go like we have to commit to a character design for. Bob Dole now, we can't sub in Pat Buchanan if he ends up winning it. Like, Because mm. if it airs in October, they say it's like a normal full nine months from writing to produ- to finished episode. What I'm, what I'm more impressed by, I mean, I assume they had like worked out the kinks on this production schedule. I don't think they like gambled uh, uh, on this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'm more impressed by is that how optimistic they were that it would actually air before the election, considering this is the the period when, uh, uh, I don't know if Fox was airing the World Series back then, but I just remember, Mm. like, it was the Halloween episode and, like, the season uh, premiere that was always, like, delayed because of baseball. I think this was one of the last years where it didn't uh, premiere with the Halloween special. Is that correct, Henry? I think so. I I remember the summer of 96 was a ton of MLB on Fox ads, but I don't think they scored the World Series until a couple of years uh, later. Okay. Yeah. All but, right. I'm, I'm looking this up. I'm looking at the 96. And yes. Bob, uh, Buchanan won the New Hampshire primary. I, Dole won the Iowa caucus and, and uh, Buchanan won the New Hampshire primary. And then Dole just started winning everything. Uh, so Dole won the vast majority of primary contests. Uh, Pat Buchanan won a couple of states, including New Hampshire. Steve Forbes won. won Delaware and Arizona. Ones, yes, correct. Delaware <laughs> and Arizona. Well done. Wow. And that's uh, I just remember from uh, SNL talking about SNL memories. Like, of, of, I think you mean Teve fu- Torbs. By the way, oh. of <laughs> fucking course, he won Delaware. The state that's just a Delaware. giant P.O. box. <laughs> Arizona's a little more confusing. Yeah, but I'm sure you there's think an they'd interesting be more reason like, for that. Uh, Sunbelt Holy Rollers or something. <laughs> It'll be more Buchanan style. Very <laughs> odd. I don't know. I, well, I think I think at that point it's all people who just moved to Arizona to not pay taxes. So yeah, <laughs> Mister Flat yeah. Tax. It's like yeah, Arizona that. is yeah. it's reactionary in a way that's kind of different from other states. Yeah. I think it's just like, you, you You had me at tax cut. <laughs> They've produced a lot more evil reactionaries than other states. Oh, like yeah. Joe Arpaio and what's his name? The guy who was the accidental governor of Arizona. Who was oh, that guy's so, a maniac. He was so bad, he like lost them the NCAA uh, yeah. convention. And he got, or the he NBA got impeached, convention. I believe. Uh, yeah, like members of both. I think he got recalled, actually. Oh, yeah, recalled. Yes. Memory doesn't serve. Uh, oh, but so uh, when the... Fife, Fife Symington? <laughs> Fife Symington, that's wow. it. Wow. Oh, man. Geez. Dan. <laughs> uh, so in the episode, though, they, they kidnap the Dole and Clinton. They're, the main jokes are that Dole is crotchety and that Bill is lazy. That's that's mainly what they had then. Uh, they, they barely have any time for it. And uh, though this line by real Bob Dole, uh, not Kang Bob Dole, I love this. What the hell is this? Some kind of tube? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Uh, just the hell just, is this? Some kind of tube. Just some. Bob Dole doesn't need this. <laughs> Why wouldn't you love that guy? Listen to him. Hilarious. It's so funny. <laughs> um, uh, but once they replace them, then the whole David Cohen, what he was really having fun with was just parodies of the inanities of a speech. Like it's just, uh, it's just a series of sketches about how empty a political speech is. Yeah. Turning, <laughs> turning, turning towards freedom. Well, let's Whirling hear towards freedom. Let's hear Slick Willie's first speech here. Ket Brockman here with Campaign '96. America flips a coin. <laughs> At an appearance this morning, President Clinton made some rather cryptic remarks, which aides attributed to an overly tight necktie. <laughs> I am Clinton. As overlord, all will kneel trembling before me and obey my brutal commands. End communication. That's Slick Willie for you, always with the smooth talk. I like that Marge just takes it as Slick Willie smooth talk. Like that, that's not insane to say. These, these parodies of speeches are way more articulate than Joe Biden is right now. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they should try that necktie thing the next time he like um, calls somebody Chuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, but yes, then the Bob Dole speech. Uh, you you mentioned him on abortion. He has opinions here. Senator Dole, why should people vote for you instead of President Clinton? It makes no difference which one of us you vote for. Either way, your planet is doomed. Doomed! Well, a refreshingly frank response there from Senator Bob Dole. These candidates make me want to vomit in terror. I've got to stop them! Ladies and gentlemen, 73-year-old candidate Bob Dole. 
Abortions for all. Very well. No abortions for anyone. Hmm. Abortions for some. Miniature American flags for others. <laughs> Forgot that oh yeah flag. That, <laughs> that, that was the first time abortion was said on The Simpsons, by the way. Yeah. Caused the, causing a scandal across the nation. <laughs> the joke there that he's a 73-year-old candidate, his age was a big topic then, and now literally every everyone's at old of, as shit. At the time of this recording, anyone who will be elected president in November is older than Bob Dole. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's different. It's that, different. Change. Yeah. Well, because everyone's got that; uh, those got that stem cells hookup. You know, everyone's yeah. just chewing cord blood all day. The adrenochrome. Uh, the adrenochrome. Uh, it's all got much super better. Seniors. It's got to be much better than it used to be. Mid nineties, that was some swag. It was uh, bad. Stepped on adrenochrome. Now you get the pure <laughs> Bolivian fish scale adrenochrome. Keep you nice and sharp well into your 90s. Well, also, in the, I love his speech about you're doomed, you're doomed. And they're like, oh, frank discussion yeah. from Bob Dole. Uh, of course, the ultimate speech among all of them is uh, Bill Clinton's dreams. My fellow Americans, as a young boy, I dreamed of being a baseball. But tonight I say we must move forward. Not backward, upward, not forward, and always twirling, twirling, twirling towards freedom. <laughs> Stop! Those candidates are phonies! I just like Homer saying those candidates are phonies. I like that. And everyone's just like, what? <laughs> How could that be? That was the first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, yeah. Homer's just telling it like it is. I love they even have him say, like, Lyndon LaRouche was right, because this is, like, the... <laughs> such a great line. The, these are the conspiracy theories of the time. Yeah. Like, uh, the, 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 you know, that poor Lyndon, the, the queen outlived him. The, uh, oh. his, his nemesis, the queen of England. Yeah, because there was also a Posadist on the cast of The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, uh, also the the way they throw a flag at him like here's your stinking flag, it's just go for your stinking flag. <laughs> uh, but I guess yes, the episode all comes to an end in Washington D.C. Homer reveals that uh, they're aliens, and I I love the the drawing of their little eyes poking. Oh, it's above so the good. Eyes. Oh, it's so grotesque. <laughs> uh, but then we get a, a quite a speech about the uh, the importance of a two party system. It's true, we are aliens. But what are you going to do about it? It's a two-party system. You have to vote for one of us. He's right. This is a two-party system. Well, I believe I'll vote for a third-party candidate. Go ahead. Throw your vote away. (laughs) 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 All hail President K. understand why we have to build a ray gun to aim at a planet I never even heard of. Don't blame me. I voted for Kodos. Go! <laughs> you know, I we re- had I, uh, I, Bill I, Oakley on stage, though. He said a lot of people misunderstand that joke about the third party candidate. And I do see people on Twitter taking that as if it's to say, you know, uh, yes, third parties are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. It's very strange because they're obviously saying, like, Given the choice, people would choose to be enslaved instead of vote for a third party candidate. Right. Yeah. Right. Because, they, because they're very short sighted. Yes. I want to ask you this. Does anyone remember which one was Kang and which was Kodos? Kang was Clinton. They they correctly. Oh, uh, were... okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was just wondering if. <laughs> what if they were just so obsessed that they recorded two versions of it? <laughs> like one where Kodos wins, one where Kang wins. Because I guess you would just really have to maybe change some of the, the, the mouth movements and just record a couple new lines. Just a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know what? No, because it's just not as funny. I mean, I mean, maybe it's just my preference to hear it, but it's the two syllables. It is. It I is. voted, voted for, Kodos. for Kodos. Don't blame me. I voted for Kang. Yeah, uh, just yeah. Cl- it literally clangs off the end of the sentence it's not good (laughs) and i i love homer's smug satisfaction the way he even touches his chest like and and puts his nose up like Uh, i I voted for godos yeah i mean the idea of like well i voted for the person who would have done the exact same thing so mm. i gotta say though i really don't think he could have gotten that 
laser plan past the Senate. Because <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, though, is who's his, who are his allies in Congress? You know, he's the only alien. I, none, I, none of them all have a shared interest in building the laser. The shot of Ross Perot punching his fist through the, the hat is yeah. pretty great, too. The, uh, one Excellent. of my favorite looks of, of Matt Chrisman in that similar similar hats. Yes, I love <laughs> I love a good boater. Well, that is one of those things. It's like, hey, why is this guy doing bad when all the other options are terrible? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he was doing great in 92 mm-hmm. for a while, and then he dropped out of the race, claimed that the RNC had pictures of his daughter that they were going to use in yeah. a blackmail situation. Yeah. And then people were like, what the hell? And then he came back and he dropped, you know, he lost 20 points that he never got back. That was weird. And he still did like 16%, something like that, in the popular vote. It was very strange. Like, that's one of those kind of unexplained things from history. Well, I mean, I think it's just this, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's one of those subterranean, you know, sort of bodily responses to the changing political situation like nobody even knew what was happening like nobody realized what we were what phase we were entering like the nafta globalization you know uh duopoly phase of of, of major poly party politics and but they, they like you could feel it you know you could and here's a guy to sort of manifest that anxiety <laughs> about that the idea that oh we are being funneled down a, a, a slaughter chute here without any uh, say on our part uh, and he had the money and the crankishness to try to get that out there and I really do wonder what would have happened if he'd stayed in I don't think he could have won obviously but it's an interesting map to imagine where maybe he wins a couple states did he give it a shot in 96 he like, did he, yes yeah. but he never got any kind of uh, real traction the way he did the last time I mean reform by like, that time he was like you know he was a joke yeah well, I don't believe he was involved in the he was allowed in the debates in 96 uh, man. which was a big part of uh, Perot's you know ability to that three person debate stage that was like the first time I watched a debate as a kid and I didn't realize that yeah. was unprecedented yeah no that was wild I uh, know they they did it in in ninety. John Anderson was on the debate stage oh. uh, during the the eighty in our eighty. Yeah, Carter Reagan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, no, he wasn't because Carter refused to debate. Oh, where right. Anderson was on the stage, but Reagan agreed to have a one on one debate with Anderson uh, that the networks carried, and Reagan did very well there, and it kind of killed Anderson's Come chances. Mm. Uh, well, yeah. So uh, that was an idiotic, <laughs> mind blowing. You're, you're gonna be running for president, and you're not gonna Jesus. Well, I mean, is the, the Simpsons are famous in their contempt for Carter. So, it, yeah. uh, well, no, I'm <laughs> saying Carter was a, a dope. Mm-hmm. Carter was a dope. I mean, everyone likes him now, and yeah, he has a good post presidency. But he was like not just well meaning and and like made the mad decisions. He was a comprehensively shitty president. Yeah. <laughs> He builds a good habitat. He does. Well, I mean, I've never been in one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what they I mean, come on. I've, se- I've seen those pictures of him, you know, like dr- drilling a hole in the, into a board with like a giant bandage on his head after he fell down in this pool. I was like, look, you know, somebody's going to have to go in right after that and do that again, right? <laughs> yeah. That's they're not. That's not. That's not going to be allowed in a home. That's not going to be certified by the you know the the homeowners society. <laughs> The hundreds of hundreds collapse. have died living in Jimmy Carter built <laughs> habitats because no one had the heart to tell him that yeah, yeah just don't do it don't come on maybe man. just like raise money for the cause yeah. or something you know we can just we'll just hire people to do we it we can hire people to do, and we have volunteers you don't have to drill just relax you're retired yeah, just relax just take a load off yeah. Yeah. they're all they're, like Ned Flanders remodeled house yeah, yeah. They are exactly, yeah. <laughs> very it just very turns into sand here <laughs> Uh, well, man, we could talk all about Simpsons and politics for another hour, and we will when I go this next. No, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't want you guys to have uh, limited time. You're you're popular folks all around, so I mean, like uh, any any last thoughts on politics in The Simpsons? I think what's interesting about The Simpsons is now politics is like there's comedy that is political, and I feel like that has. The political has subsumed the comedy part, and not yep. necessarily even in case in sense that it's always bad. It means even if it's good, it's like our. I think our show, you know, I think it's pretty funny, but it's clearly like it's it's suffused with politics. Like everything feels suffused politically. And what's interesting about The Simpsons is, and it really reflects the different era, is how unpolitical it is. I mean, it's political and it's, yeah. it presents a worldview, obviously, and it's giving you embedded ideological assumptions and it's, you know, structures and stuff. But in terms of explicit references to politics, it, for the most part, leaves those in the background. I, it's just, it feels very alien. You know, it feels like it would be almost impossible to try to do that now. And the way that they embarrass themselves on a semi-weekly basis with their topical little viral videos, viral in every sense, 
<laughs> uh, it really indicates that. Like, you know, you can't just you can't just dabble in politics comedically anymore. You, it's either you're the sole focus of your of your endeavor, or you ignore it completely. What I've always taken from the show uh, as an artist myself is that The Simpsons always held its aesthetics of comedy as its 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 paramount aim. Yes. It was not in, in a propagandistic project or an ideological project. It wasn't even, and you know, I hate using this term, but what what else can I call it? It wasn't like virtue signaling, like being good liberals. No, it was about the like jokes. That. It was about the jokes, and they would not dumb the jokes down. Mm-mm. They would not erase obscure references. Uh, they were also quite preoccupied with just the way the jokes even sounded. Yeah. And yeah, they would use a joke even if it did not conform with their politics. And that's something that really, you might call that nihilism but i mean i as as someone who appreciates comedy i'm sure uh, uh the three of you do it's something that emanates from the the, the 70s alternative comedy scene mm-hmm. what eventually became the mainstream of comedy which was you know like we said the national lampoon and the uh, snl and uh, guys like uh, you know uh, uh richard pryor or steve martin something like that for them comedy wasn't an ideological project. Of course, there were the various underpinning assumptions and so on. But no, it was about it was about the goofs. It was about the gags. <laughs> yeah. And for our show, I think that our show does oscillate between being very political or theoretical to, uh, again, just trying to put out something that is very funny in a mixture of highbrow and lowbrow way. And right now, obviously, we're at that the political peak, it being the day before Super Tuesday, and it being the event of paramount importance, the Bernie Sanders campaign, and the potential for him to beat Donald Trump and be elected the first socialist president, and for maybe the horror to begin to recede, possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think that for us, you know, we're not going to lose sight of the fact that you know, gags and goofs are important. Mm-hmm. Goofs, they're really, I mean, what's the point of any of this politics stuff if we can't appreciate just a well crafted zinger? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, did you guys want to promote like documentary or anything else? Mm. Like your Patreon podcast, anything like that? Yes. Uh, Chapo Trap House, C H A P O space T R A P space H O U S E. Google that. Only use Google, the other search engines. They're not very good, not high quality. And you can find, uh, uh, more information about our program. Do not click on the news tab, though. No, Do no, not no, read no, any no. of that. Don't read any articles about the show. <laughs> yes. Only go directly to our official website. Yes, <laughs> there's a, a Patreon and a SoundCloud where you can listen to the program. Yeah. And I think right now you're leaving to do a screening of your uh, documentary in Oakland. Is that right? That's correct. We're very excited about this. Yes, it's called uh, Good Vibes at the Iowa State Fair. Uh, you can purchase it by Googling good vibes at the Iowa State Fair. <laughs> well, I'll do it. I think it's at goodvibesiowa.com. Something. You or is that, that, I don't know. That might be pornography. Using that I don't blessed know. Google search engine. <laughs> pride pride of the Bay Area. I believe you can get that for like $3 yeah. on Vimeo. Uh, and you can watch it whenever you want. As many, many times, times as you want. You can watch times. it thousands and thousands of times. Yes. You know, it's really up to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, very, very important. If, if you're on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> at Virgil Texas. You know, trying to make some sales here. Thank you guys so much for for coming on this week. Yeah, awesome job, guys. Thanks for having us. Till next time. Bye-bye. So thanks again to Virgil Texas and Matt Christman from Trapo Trap House. Please check out their podcast and also their uh, documentary. is called Good Vibes at the Iowa State Fair. Mm-hmm. Yes. And by yeah. the way, I'm in Vancouver. I normally would be there in person, but uh, I planned this trip before they planned their trip to the Bay Area. So I miss seeing Matt and Virgil in person, and I will curse uh, every waking day of my life <laughs> because of that. Uh, but, uh, man, it was so, so nice to have them in my home. They didn't even comment on uh, my many toys and uh, assorted garbage. I I assume they would mock you um, and bully you mercilessly, but uh, uh, the, the, they're no, very nice guys. They're such nice guys. They're yeah. the nicest guys. I forgot to take a picture with them. Oh, man. <laughs> they're so nice. Yes, we love uh, Matt and Virgil, and hopefully they'll be back. And oh, uh, we sure. always appreciate whenever they come down because, they, like we said, they're very busy guys. They're they're in demand, and they just came off of a really big live show tour. So thanks mm-hmm. again to Matt and Virgil for being on the show. But as for us, if you want to support our show and get all of our episodes one week in advance and ad-free, please head on over to patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And if you sign up at the $5 level, you'll get just that. And also everything we have behind the $5 paywall. That is, uh, frankly, too many podcasts to list here, but that includes all of our miniseries. There'll be a new miniseries coming up uh, in April, I believe, of 2020. So get ready for that and another one later in the year. So two new miniseries are coming up for you at the $5 level. But you also have access to the ones we did in the past. The most recent one we did was Talking Futurama Season 2, 
part one. That was 10 new episodes of Talking Futurama. So you get those and everything we've done on the Patreon for nearly the past three years. If you sign up today for five bucks at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. And Henry will tell everyone out there what is happening at the $10 level on the Patreon. One extra long podcast every month that's voted on by patrons. That's right, Bob. The What a Cartoon Movie, where me and Bob talk about a different animated feature film for over four hours sometimes each month. Our most recent one was The Great Mouse Detective. This month, we're going to be talking about SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie. And I think you folks are really going to enjoy it. And you can only hear it in full if you're a $10 and up subscriber at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So as for me, I've been one of the hosts of this podcast, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. And my other podcast is Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast. Every Monday, head on over to Retronauts.com or just subscribe to Retronauts wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And also, we have a uh, new revamp Patreon at Patreon.com slash Retronauts. If you sign up for five bucks there, you get two new episodes that are exclusive to Patreon every month. So that's new. It's happening at Patreon.com slash Retronauts. And you should follow me, Henry Gilbert, on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. I tweet about politics a lot there, but also whenever new podcasts go live on the Patreon or on the free feed, you'll learn about it there, either on Talking Simpsons or What a Cartoon. And if you really want to stay plugged in into the world of the Talking Simpsons Network, follow at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter to stay alert. That is the official Twitter account of this podcast, at Talk Simpsons Pod. Follow it now. That's it for us this week. We'll see you next week as we get back to our regular schedule with Call of the Simpsons. In Congress did it again. What a bunch of clowns.